So we are recording. So Lucy, is it okay if I ask people um, to unmute if they wanna shout out an answer or would you prefer that I have people put it in the chat? Um, if you call them, if you, if, if you call them that way, it's th that way we don't have like three people shouting out the same at the same time. So you okay. can, you can do that. That's fine. Okay. I don't want to put anybody on the spot. So I might just, so if you raise your hand. Them, right? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, Lucy, I'm not seeing the transcript button either. Uh, is there something we were supposed to start on our end to get that? Transcript um, so running? the instructions that I have, um, please uh the live transcript can be opened in a new tab by clicking the transcript button on the left on the top left corner um hold on i don't know does anyone know where the where the light no i mean it, usually it shows up there um but i'm not seeing it yeah i'm not seeing it either which is Let me text. i'm gonna just text so she really fast I am not seeing it and um, I am going to read the the land or the ground acknowledgement. I think it's important and then um, we can begin. Um, let us begin by acknowledging the traditional stewards of the ground we are all collectively standing on. We show gratitude to the Tonga, Gabrielino, Kish people past and present for caring for this ground that was stolen from them that we now know as Los Angeles. I invite you to acknowledge the ancestral people of the ground you are currently on by sharing their names in the chat and to consider what actions you can take to help indigenous people gain autonomy today. One way we encourage you to take action is by donating to Indigenous Women Rising. Sakai will place that um, it link in the chat, which supports indigenous access to reproductive health care, and she has um, another resource that she will um, that she will share um, on the chat. Um, and then, <clears throat> hopefully, we will get the transcript issue resolved. Um, welcome to the women who submit literary workshop and orientation. We begin today's program with beginnings and endings. I am your host, <clears throat> Lucy Rodriguez Hanley. If you're having technical issues or need clarification, you can message me directly in the chat. Um, and before we begin, here's some reminders. Um, the event will be recorded and will later be uploaded to our YouTube channel. Uh, make sure that you stay muted and keep yourself muted throughout the program. Um, there will be time in the last 10 minutes for, um, for question and answers. Um, you can raise your hand or you can use the raise, raise hand emoji and wait to be called. And remember that a live transcript can be opened in a new tab by clicking the transcript button in the top left corner, but um, I don't see it. Hopefully we will get that um, resolved. Um, following today's panel at approximately 11 a.m., Returning members will be moved into a breakout room for a women who submit uh, submission party facilitated by Noriko Nakada. Uh, new members will stay in the main room for the new member orientation with Sakai Manning and the Zoom will remain open for co-working until 1 p.m. <coughs> and now I introduce Tony Ann Johnson. Um, Tony Ann Johnson's autobiographical novella, Homegoing, won Accent Publishing Inaugural Novella Contest <clears throat> in 2020 and was published in May of 2021. She won the Flannery O'Connor Award for Short Fiction in 2021 with her link story collection, Light Skin Gone to Waste, which was selected and edited by Roxane Gay and is forthcoming on October 15, 2022 from UGA Press. Thank you so much, Tony Ann, um, for joining us. And I am super excited um for what you will be uh teaching us i am going to mute myself and let you um take on okay good morning everybody and thank you so much for being here um i'm just gonna share my screen and get my set up i can find it there we go 
So I'm going to um, start with the first slide. Um, this is, can everybody see this? I don't know if the, okay. Um, this is a story, uh, Carpathia by Jesse Kercheval. Um, and por portions of this lecture are um, from a lecture that I took from Hannah Tinty, who is one of the editors at One Story. If you're familiar with One Story, you know that it's one of the top um, literary journals. They publish one story a month um, and it, it's typically done by um, subscription. So I was a fan of that journal and I happened to be in New York and there was some announcement that Hannah was teaching this story on beginnings and endings. So I took that, I've modified it to and changed it and added other things, but she began with this story um, and I need to move uh, the view. So to minimize you guys, okay. Um, and Lucy, I wanted to ask if you could if you could read the next slide for me, so it's not just me the whole time. So um, Carpathia, it happened on my parents' honeymoon, the fourth morning out from New York. Mother woke to find the Carpathia still, engine silent. She woke father, they rushed to the deck in their nightgowns. The first thing they saw was the white of an ocean filled with ice. When they saw, then they saw white boats in groups of two or three pulling slowly toward the Carpathia. My father read the name written in red across their bows, Titanic. The sun was shining. Here and there, a deck chair floated on the calm sea. There was nothing else. Can you read this one, Lucy? Yeah. The survivors came on board in small groups, women and children, two sailors for each boat. The women of the Carpathia, Carpathia went to the women of the Titanic, wrapping them in their long warm furs. My mother left my father's side to go to them. The women went down on their knees on the deck and prayed, holding each other's children. My father stood looking at the icy water where if he had been on the other ship, he would be. When the Carpathia dropped off the survivors in New York, my parents too got off and took the train home, not talking much. The honeymoon, anything but a success. At the welcome home party, my father got drunk. When someone asked about the Titanic, he said, they should have put all the men in the lifeboats. Men can marry again, have families. What's the use of all those widows and orphans? My mother, who was standing next to him, turned her face away. She was pregnant, 18. She was the one drowning but there was no one there to rescue her. So I wanted to ask you guys, what, um, what do you see as the connection between the opening um, and the ending? So I'm gonna, um, this is all technically a mess now. Um, the opening, I'm gonna read it again. It happened on my parents' honeymoon, the fourth morning out from New York, mother woke to find the Carpathia still, engine silent. And then the last line is, my mother who was standing next to him turned her face away. She was pregnant, 18. She was the one drowning, but there was no one there to rescue her. So I just want you guys to think about for a second how the writer made that connection. So she used the imagery from the opening where people were presumably drowning um, and connected that to the main character. So that's something that we're gonna think about today, like ways that we can use our endings and our beginnings um, to tie things together thematically. You can do it visually. We'll look at some other ways other writers have done it. Sometimes it's more word choice or an idea. And I also want to say that um, this isn't a rule. You don't have to make your beginnings and endings linked in that way, but it's a tool that you can use. Like just keep it in your toolbox if you're struggling with a story that you're not sure how to get the right ending, something like this may help you, but I'm not suggesting that this is the only way um, to, to create a good story. This is just 
a technique. Um, so let's look at some other, uh, the way some other writers have done this. And um, I switched out, I used to use, uh, I used to use Juno Diaz for this and I switched it out um, and I'm celebrating Sandy Yang who published in our anthology gatherings. And this is the opening of her story. 10 days before her wedding, Lydia still hadn't ordered a cake. Brendan had originally asked her to book the photographer but changed his mind when she suggested a friend who used to photograph child soldiers in Sierra Leone. Um, did I share my screen or am I not sharing? I'm not sharing, okay, sorry. I'm gonna share that and do that again. Um, so I want you to see it. Let's see. Now it's sharing. Okay, give me. Okay, so you can see it. Um, 10 days before her wedding, Lydia still hadn't ordered a cake. Brendan had originally asked her to book the photographer, but changed his mind when she suggested a friend who used to photograph child soldiers in Sierra Leone. So think about what the beginning is suggesting. Um, we can assume that this has something to do with this woman who seems reluctant um, or ambivalent about her wedding. So let's see what what the ending says and see if you can think about what you think might the ending might do and see if you were right. So this is the end. Eventually, Brandon's touch began to drift from her knee, but before he could withdraw completely, Lydia took his hand and held onto it for as long as he would let her. So what that is doing, um, is representing a change from the beginning to the end. So the protagonist in the opening of the story is ambivalent. She's, she seems to be distancing herself from the wedding. She didn't order the cake. The photographer that she recommended or that was, she was gonna hire was inappropriate for the wedding. And then at the end, the writer says that she's holding his hand for as long as he would let her. So this writer is using the, the change at the end to represent the trajectory that the characters had. So that's, that's something to think about when you are thinking about beginnings and endings. If you're planning out a story, you might wanna think about, well, where do I want this character to end up? And what would be a good way to execute that so that it really hits the reader um, emotionally. There's a good visual, there, there's something for them to latch onto. Um, I haven't looked at the chat, so I'm gonna see if there's questions. Uh, okay, no questions. Um, if you have questions or, or anything, raise your hand. I can't see everybody because of the way that my screen is set up, but I will, um, I will answer questions either after or if you want me to stop, I will. Um, but let's look at another, another example. Okay. This doesn't, okay, there we go. Um, this is from ZZ Packer. And this is a little, her approach is a little bit different. This is from a story called Every Tongue Shall Confess. As Pastor Everett made the announcements that began the service, Clarice Mitchell stood with her choir members knowing that once again, she had to persevere, put on the strong armor of God, the breastplate of righteousness. But she was having her monthly womanly troubles and all she wanted to do was curse the Brothers Church Council of Greater Christ Emmanuel Pentecostal Church of the Fire Baptized, who decided that the sisters had to wear white every missionary Sunday, which was, of course, the day of the month when her womanly troubles were always at their worst. So think about that and see if you can imagine, this one is a little bit harder, but what might the ending be or what, what do you think the writer might include in the end? So let's see. Uh, and here is her last sentence. It was God he needed, not her. Nevertheless, she remained standing for a few moments, 
even after the rest of the choir had already seated themselves, waving their cardboard fans to cool their sweaty faces. So that one's a little bit harder, not, not having the story, it's not quite as clear, but you can see that she used, she returned to the same setting. The woman is standing, it's still dealing with the choir and the church. And so she's come back to the opening uh, setting of the story. Um, let's see another one. I keep doing this. I need to share my screen again. So I'm going to do a couple more. Let's see what time is it? 3.15. Okay, this is, let's see. This is John Cheever. The story is Reunion. The last time I saw my father was in Grand Central Station. And his ending is... Goodbye, Daddy, I said, and I went down the stairs and got my train, and that was the last time I saw my father. So that one's pretty clear. Um, the last time I saw my father was in Grand Central Station. We're still in Grand Central Station, I think, um, and it's still referring to his father. So this beginning and ending is quite linked. Um, here's another one from Grace Pally, um, Conversation with my father. My father is 86 years old and in bed. His heart, that bloody motor, is equally old and will not do certain jobs anymore. So what does that seem to suggest? Um, uh, I guess we're, you guys are muted, but if anyone wants to say like, what does that connote for you? He's 86 years old and in bed. His heart, that bloody motor is equally old and will not do certain jobs anymore. So he's, it seems to be about somebody like sort of close to death, right? Um, anybody? Yes, exactly. Somebody said, yeah, end of life issues, right? So um, share this again. So we'll go. So the last line is, how long will it be, he asked. Tragedy, you too. When will it look you in the face? So he's basically saying, you're gonna die too. Um, so if you guys want to um, unmute for a second, um, does anybody have any thoughts about this or um, ideas or is anyone thinking about their own stories and, thinking about ways you might reconsider your opening and your ending. Um, does this feel like an approach that would work for you? Or it, do, you, do you bristle at the idea that this is, this is a thing? I'd just like to get an um, NM Audrey. Sure. Hi. Um, it's making me think about a story that I have in mind. And I had like one setting and then I switched to a second setting and it's my second setting that's linked to the ending. So it's making me think about putting that second setting at the top or cutting the first okay. little section. So yeah, if it feels it feels like that would that would make it more cohesive in some way. Potentially, it just it's showing me how um, important that connection is to the mm -hmm. circularity. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a I think it's a good technique. As I said, I don't think it's the only technique, um, and we'll talk more about that. Um, I don't think there's any hard and fast rules. And once I learned this, I did it all the time. Um, but I think that that can then become predictable because then everybody who reads your work knows, oh, she's going to make a connection between her opening and ending. But mm -hmm. I liked it so much when I first learned it, and it, this was back in. 2012, and I was still kind of look, feeling my way through fiction, I thought, oh, you know, that, that'll that make everything work. That'll fix everything. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it, it's definitely a good thing to know um, because it, uh, sometimes endings are hard for people and it's a way to think about, oh, like maybe I can make it work by tweaking it in, in this particular way. Um, so I, uh, somebody's Chat, put something in the chat that I wanted to read. I, I had a minor character in the first paragraph and I'm thinking of removing them. I think that's a good point. There, we're, as, as this um, goes on, there's, a, there's some more slides with instruction and 
one of the thing, one of the references is, is, um, is your is your protagonist introduced in your opening? And if not, um, what is introduced in place of your protagonist? Um, Laura, you have your hand raised. And um, sorry, before, um, and also Desiree after Laura. Okay. Yeah, I, I have a question. One of the things I've been playing with is outlining. And this seems to play into some of the things I've been doing with outlining just to help with how I tend to go off in a lot of different directions and to be able to have there be a through line for a story. So this seems very much in keeping with outlining. And mm -hmm. I wonder if you can comment a little bit about that. About yeah, I think that this is a technique for your second draft. If you're, a, if you're a first drafter that just starts writing and doesn't really know what your ending is, you have to wait until you figure out what your story is about before you can, you know, create an ending for it. You don't know how it's going to end. I am an outliner because I come from screenwriting and it's really a waste of time to write a screenplay without knowing where it's going because the screenplay is in acts and when you write, you're writing to the end of the act. And so everything sort of has to be planned because it's set up and paid off. And so I outline, so this technique works for me, but there are writers who have to get, just jump in and write and figure it out first. So this is a revision tool. This isn't something that you want to use if you don't like figuring it out in advance. Um, it's something to, to think about once you get to the end of your story and you have a sense of what, you know, the approximate ending that you're going for and then you go back. Go ahead, Desiree. Hey, Tony Ann, thank you for doing this. Very excited. For, uh, you said, how does this feel to you? Um, so it reminds me of a workshop I took a long time ago in the sense of the eternal return. So if you look at structures, that character goes through stuff and then comes back. Mm. And I, it also makes me think of when writing a novel or even a short story, finish the story, then go back to the beginning. Is that mm -hmm. the right beginning for that short story? Mm -hmm. I, I kind of like, as you were saying, think of what the emotional impact you want that character to make. And that's how I kind of try to structure a story. How do I, how do I want to land the ending? I yeah. want to stick the ending. How am I going to do that and build towards that? So anyway, mm -hmm. it resonates a lot. I think that's yeah. what I'm trying to say. So thank you. <laughs> I'm glad. Thanks. Um, I just want to read something in the chat that someone posted. Um, and M. Chloe Noland. Um, I like the idea of contrasting the same scene in the beginning and end, but making the emotion completely different changed. Yeah, like you definitely don't want your character to, to have be in the exact same emotional place at the end as they are in the beginning, because the whole trajectory of the story tends to be about the change that they undergo or the insight that they come to at the end of that journey. Um, and so, yeah, that's a good way to think about it. And um, going back to what Desiree was saying, exactly, like it, it is a good way to um, plan out your story and decide like, where do you want this character to end? And then if you figure that out first, then yes, go back to your beginning and say, well, is this the right beginning? Because I want there to be a feeling of transformation and change. So you want to make sure that the character starts out one place and ends up someplace somewhat different. And that's, that is one technique. So I also want to say that the structure that we tend to use is also a very Western structure. It's, you know, from European ideas. Um, it's not the only way to do it. it. It's the way that we most often do it, but I don't want to suggest that there aren't other structures or there aren't other ways to tell a story or even to say that a character has to change in every story. It, it, I would say like in 97% of stories, like the character tends to change, but sometimes they don't. Um, so these are things to think about. Like we're, we're practicing um, a way of telling stories that, that, that is comfortable to us because it's, we've learned it, it's in our subconscious, it, it's the way that we've come to expect stories to be. 
but I, I do want to remain open to there's other ways to tell stories too but I'm trying to give you a technique for this the the common way <laughs> um, that you can use that it will, will, may help your work and if your goal is to like publish in literary journals this is something that might be useful so I'm going to go on now um, uh, also, will there be a bibliography? This is from Desiree. Bibliography of the stories you've used as an example. Um, no, but um, I did send Lucy a PDF of um, of this whole lecture, and so if you want that, Desiree. Um, Lucy can send that to you and it lists all the stories. It doesn't have Sandy's because I switched out Juno Diaz for Sandy. So it's my old version, but all the writers and the names of their stories are included in that. Um, so I'm going to go on now to the next uh, thing. And, wow, there's so many things on my screen. Sorry, bear with me. I'm going to share my screen in a second. Okay. So story beginnings affect elements initially informed by your subconscious like theme and subtext. So just think about that for a second, let it roll around in your mind. Um, when you heard the opening of Carpathia and when you heard the opening of the other stories, most likely your brain was like creating pictures in your mind and thinking about what this might mean. And your, your, your mind is working as you, as you come to the page it's telling you things and, and making assumptions and doing a lot of work to make meaning in the story, whether you're aware of it or not. And the same is true of your readers. So for your story beginnings, it's affecting your readers in their subconscious and they're thinking about whether they're aware of it or not. The theme and subtext, like what is this, what is this really about? The text is saying one thing, but what's the meaning? Um, beneath that. Um, clues to your endings should be embedded in your beginnings too, so that when the reader finishes your story, even if it's a surprise ending, they can return to the beginning and think, ah, I see it was all set up from the start. When you begin, your character should be wedded to some problem. You should have some rough approximation of what the ending will be. Um, and side note, this might not work for the, those of you who don't plan in that way, then you would apply this to when you revise, not to when you begin. When you revise, <laughs> uh, you should have some approximation of what the ending will be. As you work, be careful not to start the story too early. One effective strategy for good beginnings is to start the story at a point of dramatic tension where in which the reader still has enough context to be grounded and still not confused. So if you think about some of the, the beginnings that we saw, I think that holds true. Um, so I'm just gonna go back to, um, uh, let's see. I wanna go back to Sandy's and I don't have it in front of me, but Sandy's be Sandy Yang's beginning, let us understand that her, protagonist was ambivalent about this wedding that was coming up. And that, that was the subtext of, of what was on the page. She hadn't ordered the cake and the photographer that she chose or that she was thinking about was a war photographer, like completely inappropriate. And so I think that's a good example of a story that gave us enough context to be grounded and not confused. We can understand and infer that this was gonna be about a character who was not sure about getting married. Elements of a good beginning. Consider offering the reader one or more of the following in a beginning. A sense, a sense of mystery or atmosphere and an, an interesting initial situation, immediate tension and excitement, an unusual or interesting description, a unique point of view. So I think that this might be a lot to digest just on this slide. And so 
this is all included on a PDF that will be made available to you should you want it. Um, or if you want to take this down as notes, feel free or do a screenshot. Um, but I know that it's we don't have enough time to really ponder over each of these things, but I want you to just have it um, if you feel like it'll be helpful to you. So I'll try to make sure that you get it if you want it. Questions to ask about beginnings. Is the main character introduced in the first scene? Um, so somebody brought that up that they had started the story with a minor character and she was considering uh, switching that out and maybe changing the beginning. Um, I think it is probably most often best to start with the protagonist. Um, if, is the main character introduced in the first scene? If not, why not? And what is emphasized in lieu of the protagonist? Um, does that work? Is it, is it the best way to begin? Is the main character fully integrated with the other elements? Meaning, can we begin to see the character's opinions about his or her environment and about other characters? And I'm going to refer you back to Sandy Yang's opening again. Can we begin to see the character's opinions about her environment and about other characters? I would say yes. So in Sandy's beginning, we could tell that the character was not sure about her partner. And she was sort of in her mind uh, doing things to sabotage um, the progression of their relationship into marriage. Are the relationships between the characters clearly drawn early so that there is no potential confusion for the reader? For example, a character we think is someone's son turns out to be a cousin instead. Have you chosen the right viewpoint character? Would someone else have more at stake or be more interesting? Is the starting location appropriate for the story? Will that location appear again? If not, is this the right location? I see a bunch of uh, things in the chat and I'm gonna get to those when I get through this. So hold tight. Is the issue, problem or dilemma in the story clear to the reader to the degree required in the story? Have you been too subtle or too obvious? Is the tone of the opening consistent and does it carry through the rest of the story? Does the opening support the ending? Um, so I'm going to stop the share for a second and look at your, uh, see if there's any questions I should get to before we move on. Um, okay. Uh, if anybody had, has anything, um, these, these just seem to mostly be requests for the PDF. If anybody has anything that they'd like to ask or want me to touch on before I move on to the endings, could you raise your hand so I could see? Okay, I don't see any raised hands, so I'm gonna go back. Oh, I do, okay. Um, and M. Audrey Harris, Un unmute. Hi, um, I do have a question. Um, if a story deals with a character like thinking back on an incident through memory, then how does that change like this idea of location? Because I feel sometimes like I have this problem of the beginning is kind of slow because, you know, it's a character working through memory. They're not in the middle of action. Right. So I actually have a story like that. And I, <laughs> I started, I started the story like in, in a place, but then it goes back to memory. So I think that you can connect, you can have the character, if the, if the story starts in memory and then the character is in the present, you could put them in their mind back in the memory and how they might see it differently or how they might alter the, that memory or how they might, how they might have, how their perspective on it has changed with their growth. Um, and so there are ways to do it. It doesn't necessarily have to be that you actually write the character physically back in the past, but you can have them revisit the past in their mind with the awareness that, okay, now that I'm this age and this happened at that age, how do I see this differently? And how might it benefit me to, to mitigate my perspective in this present now? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, there's one new message. I'm going to check and see. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. By the way, NM is new member, so I'll just call you Audrey from now on. I'm sorry. I didn't know. Um, okay, I'm going to go back to the screen and, and do the endings now. Uh, let's see. All right, so we're back. Um, elements of a good ending. A return to the setting, situation, character, dramatized at the start. I think we saw that fairly consistently through the, the few examples, the four examples that I used. Um, we always came back to the, char the main character. Um, the, a push past the opening setting situation, a character in essence, travel beyond where the traditional ending might stop so that it isn't exactly what the reader might predict. That would be my preference <laughs> because you don't wanna be, the last thing you wanna be in your work is predictable. So that's something that I would, um, that for me, that's what I would like to use is like sort of going back to the opening but sort of pushing beyond where the reader might anticipate I might be going. Reveal the opening as a kind of facade or sham and present a new and different scenario as the true reality. So one thing I want to say about that is this goes back to, um, it contradicts what I said in the beginnings where you want to wed your protagonist to some problem. Sometimes your protagonist doesn't realize they have a problem. So sometimes the protagonist is in um, is in denial or thinks everything is wonderful, and the the ending then lets us know, lets the reader know that no, that wasn't true. The character thought everything was great, but the ending reveals that ah, what the character thought was wonderful really wasn't. Um, so that's a that's something to think about when you get that PDF and you see that part where it says the character should be wedded to some problem, there's an, there are exceptions to that. Um, end up at a place quite different from the opening, but with some return to a common theme or character. Um, so that might apply um, for Audrey's question. So maybe we she starts in the past, but we end up someplace else in the present. But what she could do is, Maybe there's a way to connect it thematically, um, or at least it's the same character. So end up at a place quite different, but with some return to a common theme or character. Embedded in endings too is a simple subtext in terms of where the characters are left in relation to the opening, um, the status quo or the character's view of reality is revealed as false. That's what I was just saying earlier. Um, the situation at the beginning cannot be returned to because it, is, because it is intolerable, a lie, a sham. Status quo is returned to either because status quo is perceived as a good thing or as an ironic thing with character possibly unaware he or she is returning to a kind of purgatory or hell. The status quo no longer exists to return to or to reject, and the characters along with the reader are left out in the unknown. Questions to ask about your endings. Have I stopped too soon? Have I gone too far? Have I tried too hard to provide closure? Um, that's, that can be a trap, like when you try to tie everything up into a neat and tidy bow, sometimes that can be overkill and boring and doesn't allow the reader to kind of stay with your story and participate in thinking about what's gonna to happen to this character because you've told them everything. So I think that's a good one to um, put a pin in. Have I provided too little closure? Does my beginning support my ending? Does my ending support my beginning? Do I provide the right type of closure? There's a typo there, sorry. Have I made things too easy for my characters? Most endings should do at least one of the following. Resolve the central question, conflict, or problem posed by the narrative, but leave open-ended other secondary questions. Reinvent or recontextualize the questions posed by the story or novel. Leave nothing resolved overtly except by inference or implications, asking the reader to provide the answers from the clues provided. 
reveal that the central quest was a false or deceptive one, a trick ending. A great story provides the reader something unexpected that when considering the beginning of the story still makes sense, and does not make the reader feel cheated by the writer, it completes a structure more complex or simply different from that expected by the reader. Okay. So that's a lot, I know. Um, so if, it's, if it seemed like too much, um, you'll, you'll get the PDF and you can review. Um, but you can at least start thinking about your own work and any stories that you're working on that you're considering fiddling with the ending or stories that you might work on in the future maybe you're going to think about this you know before you begin um i hope that you know that this the idea of the connection between beginnings and endings and how they work with each other might um, find its way to your work um so uh, let's see, I have I have about five minutes. Um, I want to play you something that is from it's a video. It's a five minute uh, video and it is the opening and closing of films, the, the first and final frames of films. And I just wanted to show you this because it's a it's a good visual image to see how filmmakers um, use this technique. Um, sometimes the, the beginnings and the endings look almost alike. Sometimes they're the poetic opposite. Um, so here we go. Let's see. So just so you know, it's, it's about five minutes long. I'm trying to find the Is there sound on it, Tony Ann? We're not hearing any sound. Oh. Yes, I don't know why. Am I muted? For your share, when you share the screen, there's also a share audio option. Just make sure that when you're sharing the screen, you're also sharing where, audio. Where is that? Where is the share audio? Go ahead and stop sharing the video and then share it again and you'll see it. Where would it be? Because I don't see that. When you go to, just go to share your screen like you previously were. I am now sharing. Oh, I mean, just like when you were sharing the, like. Oh, I think I, I think I lost the whole thing. Okay, there, there it is. But uh, what does so it stop look? sharing the screen and then start sharing it again. And you should see at the bottom a um, share audio. When it says share screen, it also has a box that you can click. Share sound, okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. No problem, thank you.
So, can you guys hear me? <laughs> uh oh, I don't think I stopped the video. Um, any questions? I'll, I'll go in the chat and see if there are more. Um, Tony Ann, I was just, um, thank you for that. That was really beautiful and such a great way to kind of sum up thinking. And for me, it was also helping me think about genre. Like is like often I'm like, is this a short story or is this a novel? Like how long is this story? And really thinking about the book ending of the beginnings and the ends, mm -hmm. like how much space do I need in the middle to get from point, you yeah. know, from beginning to end. Oh, that's good. Um, yeah, no, after I, the first time I saw that, um, it made me watch movies differently. Like I tried, I tried to kind of predict, you know, what, what would the closing shot be or what would, how would the opening scene um, be different from where we are at the end? I really love the one um, from 12 Years a Slave because they, the way that they start off and they're, they're like together, but not a family. And then the last one, you know, it's a family and that just moves me so much. Um, so yeah, and also the, the editor is great and the, the music in it is very evocative and emotional. So it kind of make, like it makes it, um, it heightens the, the way you feel about those images. But um, we, have, we have a few minutes left if anybody wants to share or um, I'd love to hear from people who might be thinking about ways they want to rethink their stories or, or if anybody came to any kind of um, conclusion about you know, what their story's doing? Are they seeing anything different? Anybody? I have a comment. This is back to the clip you showed that um, uh -huh. for me, the two most powerful images were the 12 years a slave and the Godfather, mm -hmm. because like with the Godfather, it ends, the sa it's the same frame, except he's just older yeah. or maybe not really older, but he's just, you know, and then with 12 Years a Slave, it's like you said, it's so it's like you definitely see the arc in, yeah. in, the, in those two, even though the image hasn't changed much, but you definitely okay. see the arc, which and, tied into what you said earlier. Yeah, and if you think about the, the content, I think if I'm remembering correctly, Michael Corleone in the beginning, like didn't really want to be like his father, but then by the end, he, he basically had become the same person almost the same character the godfather um so that's really it like when you know a little bit more about the context the images are a little bit more powerful because it's like this young idealistic man has turned into what he didn't want to be right um other comments um alex 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 oh, hi yes thank you so much this was so amazing yeah, for me, one of the things I really love about it, especially how you ended with this video clip, is I think we as writers, we tend to focus too much on the words. Mm. We're always told, okay, show, not tell. But even as we're showing, we're really telling it in our head. And so yeah. I love it how you're showing that if we can see it in our head visually, mm -hmm. as we're writing also, we can merge the two together and make it so much more powerful because we're literally painting the images for the reader and all the emotions that goes with it versus just, you know, word by word creating mm -hmm. um, just a story through language, but through yeah. the visual as well. Yeah, you're, you are creating something for your reader to visualize as they read, like it's the mm -hmm. dream that's playing in their head. And so you are, you are making the pictures, basically. You're like writing the, the movie that's running in their head when they read your story. Yeah. Um, somebody else had their hand up. Was it Carolyn? Um, so for me, I have a short story that I'm revising and um, two things I got. The short story at its core is about loneliness and the ending is pretty subtle, but a human connection is made. But the first paragraph, I was just all about getting all the description in there. So you, you know, you physically, you see the appearance of this character, you see the house that she's at, but I don't get the loneliness doesn't come in until, you know, two or three paragraphs down. So now I, I think this is very inspirational and I loved it and go back. It's all about that. People talk about the strong first sentence. Mm -hmm. Now I think I understand a little more. What yeah. I mean, I, I as it. you were talking, I pictured your character just alone in the house. Like, just seeing her 
alone, like through the window or something, just this solitary figure kind of without any, you know, any connection that would make your, I mean, not that you have to do it like that, but yeah. as you were talking, that's what I pictured. I pictured her alone in, in her house. Yeah, her and her cat, right. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe the cat won't come. Like maybe she <laughs> got a her too. <laughs> um, good. Well, I'm glad that was helpful. Um, any any other comments or questions? Anybody? Did I miss anybody's um, anything in the chat that anybody wanted to make sure was shared? I think we have like six minutes left. Um, well. Since we do have a, a, I have oh, a quick two hands. Comment. Oh, hi, Angela. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Angela. And then, um, and then Noriko. Oh, hi, gosh, uh, Tony. This was amazing. This is Thank so you. amazing. I tell you that Antioch education and just that hands-on approach and all that you've done today is just amazing. I, I, but my question is, I'm writing uh, a memoir, and so. I could see how so many of the things you share today would factor in in that. My question is, um, in beginning, does that's where I'm kind of stuck because mm -hmm. something very tragic happens and I don't know if I should start there and work backwards. I'm just kind of just going back and forth with it and it's got me kind of stuck. So I don't know exactly because the theme of the memoir, of course, is 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 what violence does to a family, mm -hmm. and how it cha how everyone is changed by a, a particularly tragic incident, mm -hmm. and so I'm 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 just kind of stuck in trying to figure out how to navigate from that point, or you know, do I show the fun parts, or you know, the engaging parts, the cultural things, and then get into that. I'm I'm just really kind of stuck, oh. but this has certainly helped. And then as far as how, I know I'm saying a lot because I'm thinking about the time limit here, but in terms of going in and then ending up with that, I mean, is that, does memoir, is it different from memoir? I don't or? think it's different, um, but but does, does, the, does the memoir move from one place to another? So if it starts off with violence, does it come to a perspective um, about that violence and is there healing by the end? Or is it still, is it just as violent and, and is it in as much turmoil at the end as it is in the beginning? There's, there's, um, there is healing, but it's unspoken healing. Okay. It's like the incident happens mm -hmm. and then next day things go on just as if they never happened. Mm. It is, it's, 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 it's complex. So I don't want to take up too much time, yeah. but I was just like, you know, this, your yeah. presentation has certainly given me a lot of um, food for thought and how to navigate through this. So I'm just wondering, gosh, it's, I think now you might have to try a couple of different beginnings, but I don't think starting with the violence and then moving back into like what led to it or another perspective on the violence is a bad thing. But it's but it but I think starting with the violence could you know shock the reader into like oh my god what what's going on here and may, you know maybe draw them in um but i'm not sure i think i without seeing it i don't think i am in a position to to really give advice but i would say maybe try a couple of different ways mm -hmm. and see what what works um i don't i don't know i mean i tend to like the stories that it, like it might be that the story is not ready to be ended yet so if if the mm -hmm. if you as the writer are still as disturbed by what happened as you were in the beginning and and you're just telling us what happened it might not be the end yet the heat like post healing might mm. be the end of the story I'm not mm. sure okay okay thank you I mean that's that's just I don't I haven't read it Angela so I could be entirely wrong but that's that's my um, thought. Um, so I, Noriko and then uh, Genevieve, I think. Yes. Oh, so, oh okay. Thank you, Genevieve. Um, thanks. I was just thinking about, like, I always feel like the, the first line comes to me in a piece and then I write from that and I'm very much not an outliner. And mm -hmm. this is gonna be so helpful for me because 
I, I, and then I end up writing like five different endings and not knowing like exactly where it should end. Um, do you like how many, do you audition endings and beginnings that way? Do you, when you're well, doing this revision process? Because I come from a screenwriting background and, and you kind of have to out, well, you don't have to, but it's just so much easier to out, to write a first draft that's more like an outline than a fully fleshed out um, draft. So because I come from outlining, I do tend to have some idea of where I'm writing to. So that's what that's what makes me want to write the story is like I, I see where I want the character to go, how I want them to change from beginning to end. So I don't necessarily like do bullet points like a, a real outline, but I have some idea of the beginning, middle and end. But I don't think that you have to. I think that it's equally valid to be somebody who writes to find what the story is and then you go back and revise. I just rather than writing an entire thing, I tend to figure out what the what the points are, where it's going before I get there. But then sometimes it doesn't work. And so then I have to, you know, I have to start over. So I don't think any one is better than the other. Just one was more useful for another form and I got used to that. But I think it's fine for you to start a story without knowing where it's going and then figure it out. But if you want to shorten the time that it takes to, to finish a story, it might be helpful to think it through in your head first. Like you have this character, they have this issue, you want to either resolve the issue or not. And so you imagine, well, what would it look like when they get to that resolution? Um, and then you can write towards that. Um, sometimes that might make it easier and faster. Um, I don't know. I lost you, Noriko, so I don't see you on my in my screen. Oh yeah, I know that makes sense. <laughs> I, I put my hand down, so I disappeared. Okay. Um, so it's eleven. Um, do we have time for Genevieve's question? Yes, Gen Genevieve's question, please. Okay. I was just going to comment actually on the video that you showed and how, as a writer, how interesting it was when you think about oh, the setting being the same or different, but maybe mm. the mood was different or mm. the angle was slightly different, and just. You know, really thinking about those beginnings and endings and how similar they are, but that they can contrast too. Yes. Yeah, yeah that, that's just. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, well, I think I am. Uh, there's how... one more thing on the chat, which I think it's fairly quick. Um, okay. I am con concerned. Mm -hmm. I am concerned about, this is from Michelle Smith. I am concerned about sounding or being redundant with my writing. I wouldn't want to lose any readers or have my words lost in translation. Can you, um, uh, Michelle? Can you uh, uh, expand upon that? Like what you're what you're dealing with? Well, what I'm dealing with is you best to write down things regarding the main points and focal points. So I don't want to sound like as if I'm going on a tangent, not making not making sense. Or I want to be I want it to be clear because I'm not. I'm not clear and make an error, then I don't want to make it seem as if my words are, are lost or making well, is this right or wrong? Go to the directions. Therefore, I think I should do an outline and or do bullet points, like you mentioned earlier, as well as brainstorming to help with that goal. Because I write poetry and essays and short stories, but at one point, one day, I would like to write, I have a novel or a manuscript about you know, three different aspects of my life um, and so forth, but, you know, small steps. And that's my concern in regards to that. Because I don't want, I don't want to lose a reader. I want them thinking, well, what is she talking about? Um, she's going this way, she's going that way, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Where is it? That's my, that's my concern. So, um, so do you feel like this approach would, would be detrimental to your process? Oh, absolutely not. On the contrary, it'll be beneficial. Okay. Because it, it'll be beneficial to me to be, you know, the clarity and content. And okay. I do it, this learning. So I'm looking forward to expanding upon that and doing that from, you know, for this. But I would like to do okay. continue. Um, and I do Good. appreciate it. Thank I'm you. Glad, I'm glad it was helpful. Thank you for sharing. Um, Welcome. And Alex had a comment. Everyone has different creative writing style or process. My way is to talk to the characters and treat them as real people and ask them their life experience and what happens, why, et cetera. That's great. That's a really good, useful approach. Um, I think I need to wrap up. So I just wanna say thank you so much. Thank you, Lucy. Um, 
and Noriko, and thank you for every everybody for being here. Thanks to Kai, and um, I really love women who submit, and I'm so happy to uh, have been able to do this today. So thanks very much. Thank you so much, Tony Ann. We are indebted to you. This was such a great. I find it. It's going to be helpful to me, and um, I hope uh, everyone here goes home and starts kind of like playing with their stories and using this because I think it'll be really helpful. Um, and then, um, so thank you, everybody. Um, I just have a couple of closing announcements. Um, please help us with future planning by filling out the short feedback form. Um, Sakai will put it um, in the chat or I will put it in, in the chat. Um, in upcoming program, we have the return of the women who submit summer workshop series. We are offering free workshop in fiction, nonfiction, and poet poetry throughout the month of July. The applications are due May 31st. Um, and we will be taking a 10 minute break when we return. Returning members will be moved to a breakout room for sharing submission goals and co-working with Noriko. And the new members will stay in the space for orientation. So for the new members, um, if you can um, rename yourself with NM in front of your name so that, that way we know, um, we know who to put into the, um, into the breakout rooms. And now is our break. We will return in 10 minutes. And um, Noriko Sakai, do you know if I should stop recording? Or do you guys record the whole, um, the whole thing? I think you can stop recording, yeah. Okay. <laughs>